All right, going live now. And welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Our guest today is Ronald Malfi. Hey, Ron, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Mike. Thanks for having me on. I, really, I appreciate it. I'm yeah, looking no, forward to this. No problem. Me too. The, uh, Ron's no, okay, no, right? You know, I appreciate mine. it. Yeah, he's not, yeah, he's totally on this one. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So, um, you know, I was just thinking, right, guys, so, before we do introductions, this is July, right? Um, this is, it, it, I mean, you could be listening to this, who knows, 40 years from now after the Third World War, I don't know. But right now it's July 18th, 2021. And I was, because it's July, I was thinking back to, to last July. And thank you, DeBronzo. And uh, last July, Ron, you guys know this, Rick and Bridget know this. Last July, I had COVID and shingles at the same, <laughs> t- the same time. And the world did not look very promising. I mean, I, I, you know, we all had hope, most of us. But, you know... We, we didn't know, right? And now, uh, and plus, I have my usual chronic illness on top of that. And I was thinking, you know, I, I've got these bulges in my back, and my, I've got a follower who sympathized with me and sent me an email and said, "And I, I have those too. The pain is just fucking excruciating." I'm like, yeah, "You're telling me? I'm sorry, you have it too." And I said, "But you know, but at least it's not last July, you know." So. <laughs> There's always there's always a positive to look at, <laughs> which is maybe funny thing to talk about when you're in a horror podcast. But you know, hey, <laughs> <laughs> it, no, exactly, yeah, it, uh, yeah. It was a, it was a bizarre time. It's still bizarre, but yeah, last last summer was no one knew what the hell was going on, and so I did not catch COVID, but I know quite a few people who did, and it did not look like a fun ride. But I will say that I did have Wasn't. shingles. I had shingles when I was in like high school or college, which is supposedly an unusual to get it that young, but I guess oh, yeah, really? I'm just fortunate. I guess. Yeah. yeah. I don't even know how do you, how you catch shingles. I, I was pretty much in bed that month. Yeah. So, so anyway, um, Hey, let's do introductions. Now, uh, usually we have more panelists here. You, you said you've seen this show, so you know this, but <sighs> Apparently, these guys have lives, and they're acting like the, their lives today are more important than this. Uh, I appreciate Bridget and Rick not having this issue and, and their priorities being where they should be. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Matt's got something going on, and Rick's going to be in later, I think. Or, excuse me, uh, Pete's going to be in later. And um, and uh, I think Melissa might be in later, too. So, So, anyway... Rick, you want to introduce yourself? Tell the world who you are. Anyone who doesn't know, I know. Hey, I'm a writer and uh, pulp collector. Written articles on pulp authors and things. Uh, Rick's at ricklay.com. That'll actually, I set that up for him years ago. That'll take you right to his Amazon page. So Rick, I think everybody knows how to spell Rick. Uh, R-I-C-K and his last name is L-A-I. Rick rickley.com will take you right to amazon to his books to his amazon page so uh he's written books on the shadow um on doc savage doc savage uh carl kolchak stories all kinds of things um if you're into that stuff you're this is the this is the guy to read so uh bridget you want to introduce yourself bridget is outside today um, I'm outside today for the heck of it. Yeah. Hi, I'm, <laughs> hi, I'm Bridget. Uh, I write music and draw stuff and uh, working on lots of projects there. Um, so Bridget has a Kickstarter um, and she's in the middle of moving, you know, so That's she, thought, <laughs> thought it would be the, she thought it would be the perfect time to do a Kickstarter. <laughs> Um, I'm wow. just giving, I'm giving you shit. Um, <laughs> you should. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I'm really hoping and I'm trying uh, to to help do my little part anyway to to 
make it happen. It's really, really neat. I've got the link huh? to the Kickstarter in the show notes. Okay. So if you're watching this on YouTube or, you know, if you're watching this anytime, you know, before the end of July, 2021, um, you know, click on that link and, and, and see what it's about. But could you just like take a minute, minute and a half and, and explain what it's about? Cause it's really neat. It's like this cross between you're, you're a composer, you're a musician, you mus musician, and it's a cross between horror in a way and music. Yes. Thank you, Mike. Um, so yeah, we're about 50% funded. We've got the rest of the month to go. So we're in a pretty good spot, but would love everybody to get on there and check it out. So years ago, before I joined the Army Band, I was a piano teacher and I taught um, some composition to uh, students that were around the age group 10 and 12 around Halloween time, because who doesn't like to try and figure out how to write spooky music around Halloween time? Yeah, so hang, was, hang on a second. Do me a favor. Yeah. Move your mic just a little bit away from your mouth because you're kind of loud. Oh, away. Okay. I can't yeah. hear myself on the mic, so thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no um, That's better. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, they had a really great time uh, with it. And years later, I thought, well, this may be something that more than just 10 to 12 year old uh, piano students might be interested in. So I expanded it to uh, teens and adults who just, you want to learn about scary music and uh, maybe it, take a stab at writing it. It gives you some guidelines. So you're not starting from nothing. You have some writing prompts and some guidelines and hopefully you can write some spooky music. But if you don't, if you're not a musician and you don't want to write music, there's a interactive story and cool illustrations. So hope you'll check it out. Yeah, and you know, even if you're not a musician, it's a really neat workbook that she's put together. Uh, one of the editions of hardcover. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, if you're a horror movie watcher, which I would imagine most people listening to this are, um, you know, or at least are aware of how music in a horror movie can it, you know uh, make that scene better can it can to, you know i don't know the right way to put it you probably do better than i do but no you know, that's that's great you know you, it's very you, true you know and, I, and just fantastic to listen to on their own you know i'm thinking of soundtracks like uh the ninth mm -hmm. gate for example um you know that's that's the first one that comes to mind that i just i play over and over yeah, it's a great soundtrack. And it's, there's certain things musically that sound scary that music composers capitalize on for film. And, um, but they're not things that we necessarily explore specifically or think about. So the workbook talks about that, about different specific things in music that can make it sound scary. Yeah. And, you know, it takes a, a, a good composer and a deft touch to, have that music there setting the mood that's those that's the word i was looking for set the phrase i was looking for setting the mood but yet not getting in the way of the story yes so yes so you know even if you're just interested in in that you might take a look at this project because it'll be interesting for you uh and you've got different <laughs> tier levels really cool. and so <laughs> forth yeah it is it is i i actually am M4 and I pledged to it. So um, that's how cool Yay. I think it is. Um, all right. So uh, I've got a Patreon. The link's at the top of the show notes. And for anybody watching live, um, hey, Alan, uh, he was saying how perfect it is. You're probably looking at the comments, Bridget. But uh, anybody watching live and in the live comments and everything, if you want to leave me a tip or anything like that, um my son set this up you can do that um i am poor as i mentioned but it really is appreciated it keeps the it keeps the site going and it it funds my ferrari so you know also i i like to piss it away on things like rent and food and things like that too so that's you know so anyway um so ron 
how was 2020 for you before we get into your work and stuff? Yeah. I mean, it was nuts. I, I, uh, you know, from a personal, like just for me, I was kind of made for, for quarantine. I, I sit in yeah. and I do my own thing in a room by myself and that's fantastic. Um, you know, but you know, I got I'm married, I got a wife and I got two kids, two young kids. And that was like a, that was a bizarre home, you know, the homeschooling thing, the stuck in, in the house with everybody 24 um, seven, yeah. you know, it was really nuts. And my, you know, my girls are, they're, they're 10 and seven. So that's a, that's a tough age to be kind of trapped in the house for a little over a year. So, uh, and, and my, my wife, you know, was handling most of the homeschooling duties. I mean, they were doing it through the school, but she, you know, basically had to make sure they sat in front of these computers and uh, it was crazy. You know, I mean, we had the first, no one knew what the hell it was the first month or so. And, you know, my parents lived down the road from us and we weren't, we, nobody went to their house. Nobody, you know, I drove by with the kids in the car and just waved to the, it was like the end of some apocalyptic movie. So it was really nuts. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. you know, I mean, things you know are, are better now. They're, you know, uh, my wife and I are vaccinated. My kids are not; they're too young, so we're just kind of you know waiting to see what happens with that and how we feel about it down the road. It's just a lot of a lot of crazy decisions you wouldn't think you'd have to make. But there we yeah. are. Did Did you get sick on the second vaccination shot? I got a uh, so I got the Pfizer one, and I got a pretty bad headache with both shots, like the like the next day. I think. <laughs> Mike Downs, I'm sorry. You probably know how this works, Ron. But okay, so th there's there's like a the smallest number of people, but I love them to death. Uh, as far as listeners go, it goes like this: the smallest number are watching live on on Sundays at, at six Eastern, right? So those are the people right now. I'm looking at their comments and everything. And then there's a larger number that watch later, whether it's the next day, the next week after the coming apocalypse whatever you know if we have internet then um you know three years from now whatever and mike downs just gave me a five dollar tip and said here's your ferrari so thanks mike that's what i was laughing at <laughs> so, that'll be the down payment of my ferrari at this rate man i'm 50 by the time i'm 95 i'm gonna be able to get that thing so but no Mike, I'm going to spend it on, on groceries. Sorry, man, but I appreciate it. Uh, and then uh, the, the greatest number of people who who consume the podcast are are the people who uh, listen to it on iTunes, just the audio-only version, iTunes and Spotify and so forth. And, and I really, really love my video viewers. I love all my listeners. Uh, but that's, you know, that does make sense. People want to listen on the go. You know they're going to pull it up on Spotify or or Apple or iTunes or whatnot, whatever their preferred platform is. So you know a week or two after after we talk here, uh, I try not to go more than a week, but sometimes I I uh, fall behind, and we'll have it on audio, and I'll send you the email so that you can share it. So so that that's the deal. So thanks to all of you who are watching live. Um, did it change you? Probably not, since you're. You work from home, right? But did it change you as a person at all? Any just or just in the case of worrying about your family? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think I don't think it changed me as a person. I, I think that some of the people around me who know me were surprised at, at my reaction to it initially, only because I tend to be a pretty laid back and, and whatever kind of guy and the house can usually burn around. I'm, I'm the epitome of that meme with the dogs in like the room burning. He's like, oh, this is fine. It's That's fine. Like my style. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I remember right when all this stuff was happening. So like back in 2016, I wrote a book called the night parade. It was about a disease that wiped out a portion of the population and, and the father and his daughter are on the run from, uh, the government, uh, throughout the book. And the, in writing that I had contact, I, a friend of mine was an epidemiologist. He put me in touch with people at the who and the CDC. And I basically said, Hey, give me like death rate numbers for a, for a fictional disease that wouldn't it wouldn't kill society, but would grind it to a, a, a halt uh, where it teeters, right? So this and is your fault? 
it, it is my fault. I guess. <laughs> and, and they said, well, Ron, we're creating something. Would you like us to mail you a sample? So now send it to my, my PO box in Wuhan. No. Uh, so I basically, uh, yeah, they, the numbers they gave me were, were the, what turned out to be COVID numbers. And they even said, they're like, yeah, but this won't ever happen. I said, ah, it's, I'm a horror writer. I can make it up. It's cool. But like that, the, the 0.5% animal. And at first, you know, a number like 0.5%, you're like, oh, that's nothing. But when you see what that means in, in right. the amount of people, you know. Uh, so when all this stuff started and, and I'm watching the numbers and I'm watching the transmission, and I'm, I go to my wife, I'm like, this is the freaking night parade. I said, I hate to be that guy, but let's not, you know, let's stay home this week and see how this plays out. Maybe, you know, I didn't give a shit about toilet paper. We bought, you know canned food <laughs> but yeah yeah but no i said look I, i'm taking it seriously and i think given my personality everybody around me is like really you you're the you're the guy taking it seriously but like yeah i don't know I just well, I, I, t- I took it seriously but i was just like it's one of those things where i it's not something i can control so why worry about it which sounds so simple but you know it's it uh i guess you have to get to that place um but uh but yeah danielle my wife's english teacher and she's like well they'll probably be off school for a couple weeks you know and stuff like that i'm like no you're not going back you know and they didn't so and for teachers for well for many people uh who work nurses doctors hell the person at the 7-eleven um very very tough for them but 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 for teachers you know going to school every day and wearing masks and some remote learning and and making the kids wear masks yeah i mean you know i mean look you know the the bottom line is we were extremely fortunate compared to some people and uh, yeah you know i'm I'm grateful for that and we just did what we we had to do and, and what we could do yeah uh yeah you know paul have you read his book yet paul survivor song oh uh you know what that's the one paul book i haven't read yet yeah that's one of the only paul books i haven't read yet because i'm, I'm like no i don't i don't, I don't want to go there yeah and and his disappearance at devil's rock is one of my favorite books that's a great book yeah and he and he's a good friend but i i was just like um i'm gonna wait a couple years you know before i read survivor song yeah. but you know everyone says that it it kind of just lined up exactly, you know, like the denials and it lined up exactly the way it was supposed to be. But I I think what I'm trying to say out of all this is besides how did it affect you as a person, you know, just trying to get to know you Mm -hmm. um, is that, uh, you know, hope is real and we're, we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and that's, that's wonderful. You know? Yeah. uh, yeah. All from Carol Salinas. <laughs> um so anyway uh okay we talked about bridges kickstarter um so you, you live in the northeast is that right northeast usa i'm yeah i'm in maryland maryland okay i'll bet you get some nice uh autumns up there we do it's uh it, it actually just cooled off today but we've had some blistering hot days out here uh past couple of things a little over a week it's been in like 95 yesterday like around oh wow yeah but uh yeah it's you know what i'm i'm right right outside of annapolis um you know by the chesapeake bay it's my love it here you know my i'm originally from brooklyn new york my family's from there but we uh i you know we moved out here i was i was young and we all my whole family came out here and we were like the the only people in my entire you know familial line to leave the city leave brooklyn and uh so this was like the country to me when we we first moved here like wow (laughs) <laughs> people wearing no no shoes outside that's weird you know but i fell in love with it i think this is a great place to live how, how old were you how old were you, were you when that happened i was nine or ten when we moved here yeah mm-hmm. um so were you just like a regular kid you went to regular public school high school yeah. um uh college yeah i went to towson university okay what did you major in uh english it was an english major English, uh, a mass comm minor, I think. Did but you I, major in English because you knew you wanted to be a writer? At what point did you know you wanted to be a writer? 
well, I knew I wanted to be a writer when I was much younger than, than that. I majored in English because I figured it was the easiest thing I could do. And I could skip as many classes as I wanted, just mail my papers in whenever, you know, and that's. Plus you, know, you speak it. Yeah. Kind of what I did. I hope nobody from Towson watches it. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it worked out, but I, I will say as I got older and I look back on it, I'm like, man, I, Typical me, I did the least amount of work to get to what I needed to achieve, and uh, now I'm like, man, I really kind of squandered that college career. I could, I could have studied something a little, you know, I could have learned something instead of taking it easy. Uh, I guess is the thing, but no, it was I had a good time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you want to start writing? What start and what age was that roughly? What started yeah. you down that path? You're like, I know writer. That's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, well, you know, it was, I was pretty young, probably 11 or so. It was soon after we moved here, actually. Um, yeah. uh, I remember I bought up an old typewriter from a yard sale and took it home and just started writing stories. And I was always interested in anything kind of like art, artsy creative. I was, I was big into drawing. Yeah. I was big into music. Um, you know, so I would always kind of try my hand at anything. So writing happened to be the natural, you know, I as I started reading, I said, oh, I, could, I want to try this. So I started doing Okay, it. wait a second. So typewriter, I, I don't want to be yeah. rude, but are you around the same age I am? I am 44. Yeah. Okay, so you're, 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 you're young. Okay, so uh, compared to this old man, anyway. Um, I'm sure the typewriter that I owned was kind of old when I bought it. So it wasn't <laughs> like that was the, it wasn't in the Macy's front window. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I remember writing when I got into real estate, like in the, in the mid nineties, I remember writing, you know, all my goes down on a word processor and then putting it on a desk and everything, yeah. you know? So. Well, I, so, I wrote yeah. my first novel on a, on a word processor. I had to figure yeah. out how to change the file after, after it sold just so they could use, you know, use the a workable file. But I didn't yeah. even own a, my, my parents didn't own a computer when I lived, grew up there, when I, you know, and we were kind of on the, the edge of, you know, maybe maybe half the houses I, I knew had a computer, but I didn't actually own a computer in my home until my wife and I moved in together. She had one. So, oh wow! Yeah, I didn't even you know. Uh, no, no Commodore sixty four for you growing up. Oh no, I <laughs> dude. This is why I had to walk around the house with this laptop to get a good signal before we started this. I <laughs> Trust me, this is not my it's not my strong suit. <laughs> hey, Pete Rollick has joined us. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, Ron, oh, do you know Pete? No, uh, we... I don't know. Uh, Hello, Pete. Nice to meet you. Pete's the author of uh, many, many things Peasley Papers, Reanimators. A anything else you want to throw out there before I continue with Ron, Pete? Weird Company, Reanimatrix. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some forthcoming stuff. Yeah. So uh, good to see you, buddy. You have, nice you have... to be here. Did you have fun fishing? I did. I think I pulled something in my shoulder, really in big fish. So we'll talk about that later. Well, you know, at your age. Um, what, uh, at what point did you like, this is what I want to do for a living? I mean, you started, what'd you say, like nine, 10? I, I, I really am interested in this. But what point did you go, this is what I want for my job? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was like around uh, around eleven, I guess. I started writing, and uh, I make. I, I don't know at what point I decided that. Um, I, I could think back to steps I took to when I was older to actively pursue it and and, yeah. and to make money. But um, you know what? It was just sort of this. I just always kind of assumed I would do it when I was that eleven year old kid writing these stories. Uh, you know, I used to. I, I was a voracious reader. I read everybody. I was a huge Stephen King fan. So of course, all my early stories kind of cribbed basically whatever book I was reading of his at the time, my stuff kind of was the same. And I would draw the covers for them and everything. And I just always in my head said, ah, oh, well, someday my stuff will be like this. And I just kind of, I was, I guess, naive enough to think it, it was, it could happen. And so by the time I started actually pursuing it, I already fooled myself into thinking I could. So I guess that worked out a little bit. But You know, Christopher Reeve said something, and I won't get this exactly right, but he said, uh, at first our dreams seem impossible. And then they start to become possible and probable. I'm not getting that exactly right, but I'm getting the gist of it. And then at last they become inevitable. You just made me think of that quote. 
Yeah. You know, you're just, okay, this is the path I'm moving towards. Whatever I do wrong, I'm going to not do that again. And whatever I do right, I'm going to keep doing that, you know. Well, you know, it's funny. I, a, a question I get asked a lot by by up and coming writers, people who want to write is, you know, how, how to not be discouraged? How, to, how do you deal with all those rejections? How, you know, how do you keep going in the face of people telling, you know, not publishing your work and not selling anything? And it's a tough question to answer because, like I said, I think I was kind of naive enough to, to think it was just going to happen when I when it was when it was the right time and when I was ready and, you know, when you know believe in fate or whatever that is you know when that when that was going to happen so i i got a ton of rejections uh but i never it never really bothered me and i always kind of said well all right they didn't like it but i'll send it somewhere else and i'll keep moving and it just never got me down because i always figured that this would be where i ended ended up and you know I, probably because i started so young i was stupid enough to think that and i like i said i almost kind of tricked myself into carrying that that belief into my adulthood and I just never kind of questioned it. I always wanted to, I knew, I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. But you know, maybe it is naive. I'm not the one to say, but you know, when we're kids, we have dreams and when we grow up, some of us let go of those dreams and they're like, just life is just the way this, this is others. They're like, no, I'm going to keep pursuing those dreams. And, you know, you're one of those people. I admire that. Um, you know, uh, you're not the only one on this panel that, right. that's one of those people. But, yeah, that's what you're talking about. Um, you seem to have, when did you get your first book published? First book was in 2000. So, yeah, I, I graduated college in 99. So it was a year out of college. And I just did not want to get a real job. So I, I had written about six or so full-length novel manuscripts throughout college you know college years and i said that i'm gonna pick the best one out of all of these and see if i can sell it and uh yeah i took i mean i started shopping it around right before i graduated but uh, and i, I went up it was a small uh, press uh that i found that published it and um you know as soon as it got accepted i'm like oh I made it. I could just I could put on my smoking jacket and just sit in my chair and drink my whiskey. And now it was a real wake up call to what publishing actually is. Right. Um, yeah. So I think I, I think I lost money on that book just by the stamps. I, ma I mailed the manuscript <laughs> out in, versus the royalties. But uh, it, but it was a great stepping stone. Um, and my career has really just been a, a series of stepping stones. That that first book got a, a bigger an editor, an editor at a bigger publishing house to, to notice me, they published my second book. And, and it was just kind of a series of, you know, climbing that ladder with every subsequent deal, you know, over the next 20 years or so. Um, that's a long time, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, longer than some of the writers that I, I, I interview have been writing, or at least have been published. Um, what's uh what kind of questions are you trying to pursue in your writing or is there like there's probably i'm sure there's more than one thing i i've read several of your books you've got a lot of books was my point a minute ago and so it's hard to read all of your books although that's certainly something i'm attempting to do uh i love mr mr cables by the way thank you um and I'm about halfway through come come with me. So um, I, I'm loving that too. And I, I'm really loving the, the premise behind it. So um, what's sort of a theme that you like to pursue with your books or at least with some of your books? Yeah, you know, I mean, my books, I would say if I had to lump everything together, I, I would say thematically, I'm just, I, I like, uh, the question of identity, personal identity, and, and a lot of my characters in my story in some capacity are seeking some greater truth about themselves or something they don't realize, uh, you know, internally with who they are or who in the case would come with me. It, it's about a husband and, and wife. Uh, the wife, not a spoiler, she, she dies in the first chapter of the book. Um, but he learned some stuff about her and who she was as a person that did not comport with what he believed her to be. Uh, but in the process also learns to find some 
strength that he didn't know he has in, in pursuing those things. So I would say probably that whole concept of identity and, and, and kind of having a character meet that out throughout the, the, the progression of the novel. Um, but then other, other things are, you know, like theme really is, is something that I, I kind of look at after I wrote like a draft of the book. Like it's not until the story is out and the characters are developed where I go, okay, here's really what I'm saying. Now I, I want, I wanted to tell this story, but here's kind of the heart behind the story. Here's why it's important to say this. And then I kind of go back and, and smooth over some of those elements to make the themes more identifiable throughout the book. Right. Uh, I was interviewing uh, Livia, Livia Llewellyn one time. Yeah, and she's great. Yeah, she is. Uh, she's a good friend and she's a fantastic writer. And, um, you know, uh, at the time I was asking a lot of writers when I interviewed them, what's your thoughts on what is weird fiction? Um, and, you know, I, and I said, you know, everyone says something slightly different. They're all kind of the same, but, you know, they put their own spin on it. And I said, you know, one of the things to me is, is that weird fiction is, uh, you know, something happens and it's really weird and you can't explain it and you never may be able to explain it and or life is not what you think of it is it like is not what you think it is it's it's infinitely stranger than you think it is and livia answered with something i've never forgotten she said and you may not be who you think you are which mm -hmm. you know your your pursuit of the question of identity made me think of that so yeah no that that's just, it's a great response you know it's funny you bring it up i was thinking about this and uh, well, recently i was i've been doing a bunch of podcasts and, and just yeah you know, and talk about that and the whole weird fiction thing or bizarre, you know, the whole bizarro sub uh, genre, you know, and right. to me, it's kind of like, you know, you know, I think of weird, you know, what somebody may think of as weird fiction. I just think of it maybe as, as good fiction. I, I, I don't, I, I, I kind of shy away from that weird label because it's saying that if something is creative enough to be different, we have to label it weird or bizarro or strange. Whereas, I mean, you know, I think writers have been doing all that. that that's, sort of thing all the time and even mainstream like you know murakami his his books are i guess they're weird there, there could be some bizarro elements but they are also mainstream lit fic you know yeah i i, I you know when someone's trying like you know, i see a lot of these things well yeah this is this is a bizarro book because of this happens i'm like well I, I, I see why the need there to label it, but that could just happen in the book, you know? <laughs> That's kind of how I look at it. Yeah, and I'm not one for that everything must be labeled either. I, I have to agree with you there. Yeah. Um, I do tend to pursue weird fiction. I, I like stories like yours where uh, it kind of starts off and you feel like it's this real, real world setting and then strange things start to happen mm -hmm. you know which immerses you more i i feel oh I, um, yeah. you know the the labels thing is possibly more um helpful for, helpful for sales maybe you know i'm a bizarro fan okay here you go here's yep. you know that kind of that's, thing that's any of these labels yeah it's all about yeah them. yeah but it you know it's it's all very subjective as well so yeah, yeah, and that's what I'm, that's kind of it. I mean, what's weird for somebody may not be weird for somebody else, you know? Right, so. right. I, I mean, certain things like I don't know, cosmic horror. Mm -hmm. It probably is cosmic horror, but then you know, then you get a lot of arguments that oh, you think that's cosmic horror, but it's not. So who, you know, sure. who knows? So, um, so you have written a lot of books, um, and for those who are listening or and or watching this who are, who are new to you as a writer uh first of all uh ron's been around a while uh he's a great writer check out his stuff uh, i want to talk about your two newest books but before we get into that mm -hmm. what would be in your opinion what who, what what should people start with should they start with your collection uh what's that you were never really here is that right? Uh, uh, I'm called? thinking of the movie. Uh, Sorry. Uh, shoot, I can't remember the name of my book collection. <laughs> no, uh, we should have left well enough alone. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Which is a great title. Thanks. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, but, you know what? I, I don't... 
I'm happy with that collection. I'm proud of some some of the stories in it. Some of them were a little clunky for me, and I, I always put off putting a, a short story collection together because thematically, I, I was never comfortable with what should be included, what shouldn't be. I always struggled a little bit I, I, uh, with the short story because you know econ economy of word is not my forte. Um, but uh, you know, the book I, I, people seem to like it. People seem to the the I'll, I'll probably put that first story up, and that the first story that opens that collection up is is my favorite one to do at readings just because it is just a, a mind screw by the end of it but um what, what is your favorite story from that collection it's called the dinner party and it's basically uh it's a woman suffering from postpartum depression uh trying to cook for a, her husband's boss and his wife are showing up for dinner while taking care of this baby and it's just a bizarre story i i know that that's your first short story collection is that your only short story collection today yeah, I've had. I, you know, I don't see that as a criticism. I'm yeah, some no, people love funny. writing novels, you know. And it's not my. I, I'm not all of my short stories are in that collection. They're still, I, it's, but that's the only uh, collection that I have. I had some other. I had novellas that were compiled in in, you know, novella right. collections, but they were also standalone. Uh, yeah. Novellas. Okay, um, so leaving that aside, um, what uh, would you say the person you know? What? You, you know the, judging by the response from readers, I would say um, my book's bone white. Uh, people seem to find it very accessible, and, and they like that. Uh, Plus, it's going to be a TV series. Well, there's that. Um, <laughs> you, actually, you don't have to read it. You could just wait and <laughs> just watch it. Uh, um, don't say that. <laughs> it, you know how you TV know how is. Hollywood it could be, it could be years. <laughs> yeah. Um, and either that or my, my personal favorites are uh, Floating Staircase and, and December Park. Uh, those seem to be fan favorites too. But mm -hmm. and, and I'm not just saying this because I'm kind of on this book tour promoting this, but Come With Me is probably the best novel I've written. Um, so I'm, I'm really, that comes out Tuesday. So I'm really excited about that to start seeing. It, it comes out this coming Tuesday? Yeah, it comes out Tuesday. So the Sunday, that'd 20th. be uh, 20th. Yes. Yeah. So July 20th, uh, 2021. Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, thanks for sending me a, an arc. Yeah, I, I'm really enjoying it. Great. So, um, so talk about, yeah, well, you've actually talked a little bit about, uh, come with me. So mm -hmm. that'll be available on Kindle and in print as of the 20th, right? Two days from now. Yeah. And uh, audio as well. I was going to ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Audio book yeah. too. Yeah, um, just on audio too. So have you heard any of the audio? Are you pleased with it? Uh, you know, what? I, I, I listened to a clip of it. Um, uh, and I got, I got to, to pick the narrator for the publisher, which normally they, they don't, they kind of do it on their own, but uh, yeah. friend from Facebook, who, who I know, Joe Hempel uh, did it. And I've heard, uh, I, I've heard a clip of it. It sounds great. And, and the early reviews on the audio book have been stellar. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Joe's great. So. Yeah, that's great. All right. So the most recent book that's out now is Mr. Cables. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that would be, that would probably be the most recent one. I Which I have um, right here. Yeah. yeah, I'm not, I don't know if I'm showing up on the screen or not. Am I showing okay. up for you guys? All right. Yeah. Mr. Cables. Um, and uh, I kept one. I sent the rest to a certain Pete Rollick who shall uh, probably sell them for a huge profit. No, sometime no, no. Soon. I, I, somebody sent me another one. Really? So yes. How many? How many Mr. Cables do you? Oh, it's in case you want to read it more than once. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's but, right. Well, but it, it, it's fitting look, for I, Mr. Cables. It may read different depending on which version you have. Well, I, I accidentally sent him a all the the hard cover and kept the soft cover. I'm like, what the hell did I do? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm fascinated and i've written myself about books by authors that don't exist and no, they, ron, ron exists no 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 <laughs> maybe ron we, exists we think but you could know, be an avatar so and this goes I, i'm gonna di digress here back when i was running um role-playing games um i ran a game called time lords in which you could jump between various um, realities. And oddly enough, the, my currency was Depeche Mode songs. The, you know, 
various Depeche Mode songs existed in different universes and you could trade these and make a lot of money awesome. you know, <laughs> doing this. But this, I've also... This sounds suspiciously like uh, Stephen King's uh, Kindle story. If we, oh. er, you are, er. Okay, uh, I, yes, but I did this... Although he never capitalized on it, yeah. Anyway... King you probably know, stole your idea. Yeah. I've also written about <laughs> authors going to private libraries and, and seeing their books on the shelves and seeing books that with their names on them that they didn't write. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea of this existential crisis that develops that the best book you may have written is one somebody else in another dimension wrote right <laughs> uh, if i please continue people if i can just interrupt I, no. that just reminded me that i know i know no you can't interrupt uh that is exactly what grabbed me about this book mr gables when i read the back of the book mm -hmm. I, I i mean it comes down to it's like god damn it i could have been a better writer if i had just <laughs> done something different and but this Mr. Cables goes way beyond that. So yeah, you, you know I, the, the, that whole and I'm fascinated by by that too. That whole conceit about and I think it's a writer thing. Like you're like, well, you know, it, deep down, am I am I doing my best work? Is there some version of me that does it better? Is there you know, and all of that you, you know the the reveal, if you will, for Mr. Cables could have gone in a million different directions. Um, it with that novella in particular, I actually had. I knew what the backstory was years before I wrote the novella because I didn't know how to set it up. Uh, I didn't want, you know, how do you get into it without it? You know, how do you tell it what that reveal is and tell that story of what happened, um, you know, without blowing it early, you know? Um, so, and I'm not really sure what the trigger was that made me say, oh, here's how I do it. I'll pad it with, within this other story. And I'll have that be the reveal of this first story, which then when we talk about themes, thematically became what the, the, the book Mr. Cables is, where it's it's this book within a book that's that's confusing and the person, but it's only confusing with the person reading it. And, you know, and it's funny because like I, I would hear from people who've read that and they go, I can't believe I'm sitting here reading a book about a man reading a book about a man reading a book and I'm a man reading a book. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. That's weird, you know? <laughs> and by the way, there's somebody reading about you right now too. <laughs> <laughs> that's like what four levels of inception yeah right i mean that's going yeah it is it's it's deep it's deep in there but uh you know so uh, but that was sort of like the interesting part to me and the other interesting thing is just like how the main character in mr cables is reading the mr cables book and to him it's 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 like vanilla there's no, he doesn't even understand why it's good let alone scaring the hell out of people and i tried to to mimic that in the prose the writing style of the novella itself whereas if you read it and you dissect what's going on there's really nothing frightening about that that novella but it should leave you with a sense of this sort of weird atmosphere this impending doom but individually there's nothing frightening that actually happens you know so i was trying to uh, put myself to task to see if i could actually write something that i'm describing in the book that the character is reading right which reminds me in, in a little bit of, say, the passages that we get from Chambers in The King in Yellow. Mm -hmm. Individually, they're weird. Right. But supposedly, with the whole thing, it drives you insane. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and if you look at Ubu, you know, at the actual Ubu Roy, it's like individually, these scenes and this, 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 uh, play doesn't really isn't really bothersome but yet the first audience to watch it tore the, the theater down yeah because they felt that it was like the death of art mm -hmm. you know so yeah it's it's the and I I have this idea for a whole bunch of blind people translating the king in yellow you know just you know <laughs> right. but only they only get a little bit to, and then you know somebody publishes the whole thing but yeah the, 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 mr cables is is, is kind of like that it's like individually these and and let's go to the call of cthulhu the mm -hmm. yeah. you know un 
correlated content. Mm -hmm. Individually, these stories are weird, but they don't tell you anything about the universe. Until you put them together. Until you have put everything together. They have and been, they are, they will be. Yeah. yeah we I know, to I got to mention it every time you pull up Night's, you talk about <laughs> Night Stalker, I got to, I mean, Call of Cthulhu, I got to pull up that Night Stalker episode. Yes, so. <laughs> which, you know, is sadly, it's a great title for an episode that's really good, but the title has nothing to do with the episode. But anyway, we were talking about Mr. Cables. Oh, we were. Right, 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 right. I'm my office here. Yeah. yeah. This is why the interviews go on for so long, Mike, because you can't <laughs> stay focused. That's why the people who listen to this show like it so much. <laughs> it's not me. It's us babbling on forever. Yo, it's not me. It's you. <laughs> no, it's not me. It's you. <laughs> They're like, you, lo you lose Pete, you lose us. And if you lose Bridget, we sue you. So... <laughs> And Rick, if you lose Rick, you'll no no longer know anything. So you might as well shut down the show. So, so anyway, Ronald, <laughs> Mister Malfi, yes, please continue. Where, what were your influences on this kind of you know layered existential dread of a novel within a, a story within you know a, a story within a story within a story? Yeah, uh, you know, influences. I, well, I'll try. I, I don't want to spoil the. I don't want to spoil the the second half of, of the book. So, oh, did I do lightly, that? But I had that concept of, you know, what our main character does and goes through uh, in my head for a long time, and I didn't know how to how to do it. And and you know, again, I, I just I I am fascinated by the whole you know writer as main character. Yeah. It's been done a million times, but there's something endearing to me about that. And I guess it's as a writer, it's what I know the best, um, you know, but then th this whole idea of the, of, I love these, you know, the occult bookstores and the strange volume that shows up somewhere. I, I, I'm, I don't want to say too much about it, but I'm working on a project now that's, that's going to kind of take what I did with Mr. Cables and expand it like fourfold. Um, and, and I'm seeing same kind of themes, same kind of, you know, the subgenre. Um, so I'm looking forward to that, but really inspiration wise, it's just, it's one of those things that as a writer, you just think about what would I, would I do what this guy did in that same position? And, and, you know, if someone did do that, what are the repercussions to that? You know, and it's about creativity and it's about how, how badly you want to succeed in, you know, how we were, how we started this, this show, you know, how do you want to, how badly you want to succeed in this, you know, to follow your dream and, what kind of, you know, how much are you trying to get a sell of yourself in order to get there? And that's an age old, you know, that's not unique to, to my stuff. That's, you know, as old as cold bookstores. This is going to sound silly, but one of my favorite parts of Ghostbusters 2 is when <laughs> Bill Murray walks yes. into Dan Aykroyd's right? cult bookstore and I'm like, I, I want to run this place. <laughs> I can <laughs> work. Yeah. Ah, this, this is my bookstore right here. So, Absolutely. yeah, I love that. There's <laughs> just a vibe there. And it's for as bizarre and creepy as it is, there's some kind of weird comfort comfort level I get from they're cozy for some reason. I don't know, right? And the bookshelves yeah. are like stacked to the ceiling, if I remember right, and everything. And it's just yeah. like this great ambiance. Uh, Pete, you might have more questions, but I just want to uh, read the back of the novella real quick for the audience. Uh, and this is what really captivated me. I said uh, to Journal Stone, I, I'm, I, I really have to read this book. You know, I'd love an arc, but if you don't send me one, I'll, I'll buy it, you know? So whatever. Still there, Ron? We lost you on yeah, video. Yeah. Okay. As long as we can hear you, that's the most. Yeah, I'm just uh, okay. locking my door. <laughs> oh, Okay. Yeah, you better. You never know what's going to happen on this show. For for best selling, this is Mr. Cables. For best selling horror novelist Wilson Pavento, the scariest novel of his career is one he didn't write. It bears his name on the dust jacket and contains his bio near the end. But this en enigmatic tome is not part of his oeuvre, and the most frightening thing about it may not be the tale between the covers but the reason for its mysterious appearance in Pavento's life. Um, yeah, so that's what, that's what grabbed me. 
I just, I love it. So, Pete, what else you got? I know you had some more things to say. <laughs> no. Not to, put, not to put you on the spot. You can't just put me on the spot. I'm trying okay. to finish my dinner. but um... Well, I can continue. Uh, please continue to eat on the show. That's Look. You know... <laughs> no, I'm just happy you're here. I'm cold, I'm wet, and I'm just plain scared. Uh, it's been a long week. That's every Sunday. Yeah, I know. Um, no, I. Those were my, the big. I the big question I had was about sort of this existential dread that you know I see coming through the the main characters, like, and it builds. You layer it really, really well. Yeah, and yes. it it builds slowly, and you know, you. As you're digging deeper and deep, you know, and maybe that's because you've layered the story that way, and the story and the story mm -hmm. within the story. Um, so you're sort of, you know, even the, the the reader, the 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 main character is, is having these WTF moments, mm -hmm. um, and and that's an that's an interesting way of doing it to, and it. In many ways, it reminds me of, you know, you talk about writers writing, uh, Caitlin Kiernan's The Red Tree. Yeah. Which, you know, the, the author is, you know, it, you pass this novel off as sort of like, oh, this is another writer writing about how writing is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's not. Because in the first few pages of the book, you establish that the writer is is lying to you most of the time, right? And you know, I see some parallels here with Mister Cables. That yeah, I'm not sure he's 100 percent reliable, right? But and then as you dig in, he becomes less and less reliable, and you start to believe that more and more that you might be yeah, he's a bullshit artist, mm -hmm. but. Yeah. Well, it's it's he, he he's not only lying to the readers as the narrator, but he's been lying to himself, you know. Yes. And and that's it, it's a pretty meta story when when you know you take all the parts and, and look look at them from that lens. Right. Um. And you know that's the kind of stuff I like. You know. That, and again, that even goes back to you know you talk about themes about identity and and what it is that you the you know the kind of person he believes himself to be at the beginning of that novella isn't actually the person he is. You know. And. Well, not just not just lying to himself, but if 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 you if a person lies to themselves for long enough, it's very easy to believe that is reality. You're not lying yeah. to yourself. This is what happened. Was it? Is it Ellison with the quote "All the lies that are my life"? You know, that... I don't think I've heard that one. All right, so maybe I'm getting the author wrong, but the idea is that you know, you tell stories at parties. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, and you never let the truth get in the way of a good story. No, absolutely. And then you just incorporate that into who you are. Well, and the irony of that is that there is a greater truth in the bullshit that we tell about who, you know, you learn about who we are based on our lives, really. Right. You know? right. And and that's a part that fascinates me with, you know, when, with character and, and stuff like that. Not to mention the fact that when you remember things, when you tell things and you remember things, you're increasingly every time you're remembering the memory mm -hmm. yeah. yeah you know it's like copying a tape of a tape of a tape yeah e exactly <laughs> it denigrates yeah and, no, and yeah go ahead there, there there are stories about my life i only i I'm, i've come to realize that i only know because my parents told them not because i remember them and you know i'm, I'm coming to believe that my parents are inveterate liars but <laughs> You you heard it first. No. Lovecraft design, easy. Mm -hmm. So, um, go ahead, Mike. You're up. No, I was just going to say to Ron and to everyone listening that you know this me this meta thing and identity and am I really who I think I am? I I've got a recommendation for you, Ron, and for anyone. I've mentioned this before. Anyone who's forgotten that I've mentioned it. And this is available on Kindle Unlimited, and it's by an author by the name of Amy Cross, and it's a short story collection. And now they're great short stories, but the reason why I'm 
recommending this is because there is a short story in here. It, it, I'm sorry, the, the name of the collection is Strange Little Horrors uh, and Other Stories by Amy Cross. And um, Amy Cross, just like it sounds. And there is a story in there called Sitcom. And I dearly love somebody like you, any of you on my panel or any of you listening who have not read sitcom yet. I don't even know Amy Cross. Um, and I'd like to get her on the show, but I, I don't have an email for her and I've been unsuccessful reaching her. So, you know, some writers are that way. I don't want to go on a podcast and that's cool. I, I, I totally understand that. Uh, so I'm not recommending a friend's book. I'm, I, I came across the story sitcom and it blew me away. And you'll, I can't say more. You'll see why when you read it. Um, and I would dearly love anyone who has not read this short story yet to tell me what you think of it when you're done. Uh, my email is lovecrafteasing at gmail.com, lovecrafteasyine at gmail.com. Anybody's welcome to email me. Just put sitcom in the in the subject and I'll I'll know I'll know what you're talking about. So um yeah. So uh yeah check that out Ron. I you know I, I think a lot of your work and so consequently I I think a lot of your opinion on this. Yeah no it sounds great. And I'm, yeah. I'm I believe I'm familiar with her as a writer too. I'll, I'll have to double check. Yeah. So I, we know yeah we know that come with me comes out like on the 20th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you were talking about a lot of stuff that you're working on. That's right. What can you tell us about what's next? Uh, well, I've been what next? He's got like 30 million <laughs> books behind him. He could retire always, now. No one's ever grateful. They, they always want to know what's next. You know, right? right? So I've I've never seen a it's hard time. That is the reality of publishing. It's not what have you done for me. It's what will you do for me next? Right. So, it is true. That's true. You know, well, I can remember when, when my first book came out, I was like, yay, it's out. And like the next day was like, the publisher was like, yeah, where's your next book? Yep. <laughs> what? You know, oh, they waited for it to come out. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lucky. No, I got, so Come With Me is uh, one of three uh, three books that I'm doing for Titan. So that's the, and they're they're unrelated, but it's part of a three book deal. So, so uh, the, right now they're going, where's the second book? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I've got, I've got till October 1st, I think, to turn it in, um, which means I should get started on it in about a month. <laughs> now, Good idea. I, I, I have I have started it. Uh, so that's, that, that's going along. I, I, I go, I, I, I do a lot of mental prep work before getting into a book. That that usually takes up more time than the actual writing of it. I, yeah. I'm doing, well, in follow up to Pete's question on this particular book, yeah. are you allowed? Can you say anything about this book yet, or do you need to wait? The newest one? I'll probably wait. I'm still trying right. to work out some of the kinks. That's but, cool. Um, yeah, but it was an idea I've had for a while, and it, you know, similar to my other stuff, it kind of walks that that horror, suspense, dark fiction line. Um, and uh, so I've been working on that, and then uh, mostly, actually, for the, the, the past year, uh, now two years or so, I've been doing a lot of TV work. So the, I, I, when Bone White came out in 2000, I think it was 17, um, and that was the last book of a three book deal with Kensington, I did not renew my contract with them. I wanted to take a, a bit of a breather. I was doing the book a year for like a decade and it was burning me out. So um, I uh, didn't sign another contract. I took some time off. My, my brother and me and my buddies were put, put together a band and we were having fun playing music. And I'm like, you know what, I'll take a year and, and just do this. And that, and while I was doing that, um, I wound up having, um, I was realigning some of my, my, the, the, the doing some in-house in cleaning. And I wound up jumping from my old film agent to a newer, uh, the, the film agent I'm currently with now, who was just a fantastic guy. And we got a lot of projects uh, off the ground over the past uh, yeah, two years or so, Bone White being one of them. Um, and that was uh, optioned and then picked up for, for a TV series. And then um, that's what I could kind of talk the most about because it was already released in the trades. Um, the other two, one's an original series I created that was picked up 
and then one is actually the 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 TV show rights were sold for Come With Me, so we're working on that. Okay, so uh, since Bone White may turn into a TV series soon, mm -hmm. uh, is that a for sure thing, or is it one of those TV things uh, where it could man, it's never for sure. They could film the yeah. freaking thing and it could die. Yeah, yeah, uh, I understand. And COVID, um, uh, COVID yeah. uh, really kind of screwed us a little bit on that too. Um, the yeah. producers, so it was, it was. Uh, Fox 21 bought it uh, or bought the option. They brought it to, and Disney owns Fox. So then Disney said, okay, we'll do it. They brought it to Amazon. Amazon said, okay, let's do, let's, let's give us two years to see if we can put this thing together and get it on the air. And then COVID hit. And then this, the same production team was doing um, the Handmaid's Tale and Fargo TV series. And that I think those seasons got bumped back a year or due to COVID, you know, and no one knew what the hell's going on. When could they get back to shooting? What would shooting right. look like? What was that going to do to their budgets? You know, and uh, so it kind of left this one floundering out there. But I did read, so I'm not I'm not involved in any of the creative aspects of that show at all. The option that's book. a that's a good yeah. production company to have. Oh yeah, no, they've been they've been great, and it's the same players that are doing this other show that I, I I've been working on with them. That uh, probably the only thing I can say about that one, right now. but um, you know they've they've been awesome and they're very supportive of the project. They're you know I I I always seem to get along really well with the, the screenwriters that they bring on. Um, they really understand the material. They, I mean the guy I I read the the pilot script for Bone White. The guy just I mean it's I'm like shit. I wish I would have thought of some of that for the book. This is great stuff. So uh, I'm really excited about it, and I have a lot of a lot of hope that something will happen with it. But uh, regarding the book only, Bone White, can you give for those who haven't read it, can you give a spoiler-free short synopsis of what Bone White is about? Yeah, sure. It's uh, it's about a a, a guy who's uh, she's got a twin brother who's a bit of a loose cannon, and uh, you learn that when the book starts that the brother kind of like he doesn't hold down the job he's a bit of a flake he travels all over the country the last time he talked to his brother uh this guy had gone up to this remote you know town in alaska uh like beneath the arctic circle and vanished um and then um sometime later about a year after his disappearance uh, a man comes forward and admits to murdering a bunch of people from that town and in the woods up there and so he has to go to Alaska to basically, they can't identify the body. So, you know, to given to the decom decomposition and their heads were removed and all this bizarre shit. So he's got to go up and give DNA to the police and he wants to find out what happened to his brother. So it's sort of this journey of, of again, identity, you know, finding out literally what happened to his brother. And then um, also, you know, learning about himself in the process and what his, what he thought, you know, his, his, what he believed, uh, you know, his impression of his brother and the character arc, the story arc that that challenges what he used to think of him as the story progresses. And plus, it's got a whole devil possession demon subplot. So basically, this the serial killer claims that you know the, the the conceit is that the devil hunts those those woods and that will poison someone's soul and turn them into you know the person who has to. There there are a few things scarier than secluded dark woods, you know really well my um, kids downstairs that's pretty freaking scary so yes yeah. that too uh do you happen to know a guy by the name of kev kingo kev king i, I know kevin kangas is he that that's probably the guy yeah anyway i'm just wondering if you're ronald ralphie because he's watching live and he says uh i know ronald malfi mm -hmm. that guy is not ronald malfi he has much longer hair and is way drunker who is this imposter so yeah you know what uh i changed my mind i don't know him you could uh, <laughs> call security and block Kick him. him from the chat <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> he also says uh, pay me enough money and i'll tell you about uh uh the next book that you said you couldn't talk about <laughs> uh yeah he would he would know okay so kangas is a horror film director uh okay known for his movie fear of clowns um and his territory Two, what, what's when, when you have a trilogy with only two movies? A, a du duology? I don't know. Well, Douglas a Adams biology, has a biology. trilogy with five books, you know, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a quintology. I don't know. Like that. 
yeah so he he happens to be my periodic drinking let me bounce ideas off you friend and fortunately if anybody's interested a lot of money to him is like 15 bucks so he can probably tell you <laughs> <laughs> but not in a few years when he's <laughs> when he hits it big in hollywood so um you know i read a quote in an interview uh i should have wrote down where i i I, I read this. I'm sorry, but uh, you said I found I've somehow found myself as a writer in a niche where my novels tend to walk a fine line between plausible thrillers and supernatural horror. And I just want to say how much that that's exactly my cup of tea. I I love that. So yeah. Um, so yeah. Me too. You know, and I I find that the more grounded something is in a story the more frightening it can be when something out of the ordinary comes in. And, you know, and I also like the, the idea that, you know, a book can be something different depending on who the reader is, you know, and someone who wants to, to think, you know, to think that they're reading a horror, a supernatural horror novel, they could think that reading a book like Bone White come or Come With Me, um, similar, just that same book read by a different person can, can, um, you know, it could be a, a straight plausible thriller, just depending on what you believe to have actually occurred. Um, probably, I'd, I'd say that the book I, I feel that I've done this the most successfully with is a book called Little Girls, and it's a it's about um, it's about a woman whose whose father uh, dies, and she goes back to take care of the estate. She brings her husband and her daughter with her. And when she's there, and this is the house she grew up in as a child, but she was estranged from her father. And uh, while she's there taking care of the, everything, she notices that the little girl next door is an identical spitting image to the girl who lived there when she was a kid who died in this tragic accident. Um, so it's sort of this ghost story. It's sort of this, you know, what, what's really going on kind of thing. And the thing I, I like, I like the most it frustrated a good number of my readers, but the thing I like the most is the, the end of the books, literally the last sentence of the book means something completely different depending on whether or not you think this book was an actual supernatural ghost story or about a woman losing her mind and that last sentence of that novel depending on how you read that book means something completely different and no you know some people really hate that but i actually I <laughs> really love that uh, lots I, of people I, really hate it i can tell you <laughs> yeah i i love it um there's a gosh i'm trying to think of the you know while i try to think of this um rick and uh bridget do you guys have any questions uh for rob or any comments rick well it's just that i moved from brooklyn at 10 years old too <laughs> i i recognize the accent yours is a little heavier than mine um gosh what about you bridget anything I'm just excited to see if uh, Bone White ends up working out. It would be nice, yeah. So I have now. It's they, they, it's amazing how slow they move in this in the, in the, the film side of things. But uh, I think that's uh, a lot of people don't realize that too, because you know we're in the world of TikTok and YouTube, and it's like, no, you have to generate content every five seconds, and it's like, well, well, no, it's like actually a really long process. <laughs> Yeah. Some things can move quickly. Lovecraft you know, country moved very quickly. And then it got canceled. Yeah, but I was saying it got to the screen much quicker than you. That's true. Totally did. I'm not I'm not so sure that Lovecraft got country got canceled or they just ran out of good ideas. I don't know. They, they just they, said the second season was gonna happen, so yeah. They ran out of good ideas after uh, episode two. Eight. But that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Uh, uh, well, they pretty much finished the book for the first season, so I didn't know what they were going to do with the second season anyway. But oh well, I guess we'll never know. And they went beyond things in the first book, like Korea was in the first book. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Melissa. Hey. How are you? How is everyone? Good. So I came in late. I feel like I came in late to class. Like, I don't know what questions have already been asked. Uh, so I'm just going to oh, that's okay. quietly hide here. Too. That's all right. <laughs> uh, 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 Melissa, Ron, Ron, Melissa. 
So. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, the book that I was trying to think of that sort of does that ambiguity a little bit well, and I don't know if, if you've read it uh, or have gotten to it. There's so many books to get to, right, Ron? Yeah. Um, but it's called The Shadows by Alex North. Uh, uh, yes, I did read that. Yeah. Isn't um, that a creepy book? That you, you know what? Yeah, it was good. I liked uh, what was his, he did one before that that I thought was better. Um, Actually, I like this one better, but really? that's just me. Yeah. No, I like uh, the other whisper one. something. The whisper, whisper man. man. That's what it whisper was. man. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, he's good. Yeah. Did Did you read this one or did you listen to it on nope, Audible? Uh, Which uh, I read this thing. one. I, whisper man. I listened to on Audible. I read. I read the shadows. I read the shadows. I liked it so much. I've got you know had an audible credit. Mm -hmm. um, I think you hit your uh, mute button, Mike. Yeah, you just yeah I did. Sorry, I uh, had to cough. Um, and I listened to it on Audible at night when I was yeah. tired of reading. I but I wanted to continue the story. Creepy as hell, man. This is a good book. Yeah. And it's explained in such. Well, I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, but it's like it could be it could be a regular killer or yeah. there could be a supernatural element there. Mm -hmm. And there's elements in the book where the protagonist is it realizes that how much can I say or wrong without even without spoiling it, but the protagonist realizes that what he's doing right now is what not what he's doing right now. That's probably as close as I can yeah. get. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. You know, this guy's good. Yeah, and I, I think both of the, the his books had that that kind of ambiguous, it, it does that tightrope walk genre. Yeah. You know, and that, I, I'm the same with you. That, that's my favorite. You see, Mike, this is why you like Lake Mungo. Exactly. Because the first 45 minutes is like, oh, there's this horrible story. Nope, it was all fake. And oh, but but we saw this. And then, nope, it was all fake. And then we said, nope, it was all fake. Might and be fake, might not be like fake. <laughs> Plus, it's an exploration of grief and death and... The truth and... Look, yeah. I like it. Nadia likes it. Paul likes it. We just did a Patreon podcast on it. So I like the movie. I just think you guys are wrong <laughs> how are those two things both true i i think that you're wrong about what happens in the film that's all but i just think you're a moron right, well maybe we <laughs> maybe... i was gonna start then i'm like whoa we just ended like that i'm not even gonna get involved in this <laughs> next topic <laughs> um now maybe we should do a lake mungo to uh uh, not the movie Lake Mungo 2, because apparently there's never going to be a such thing, but uh, Lake Mungo 2 discussion. And you can tell Paul and me and Nadia how wrong we are. So, so yeah. Then there's Mungo number five, which is that weird dance movie that they're doing. Oh, <laughs> there's a lot of names of disappeared people to remember in that one, yeah. though. All right. Have any of the rest of you read uh, The Shadows, Alex North? I have not. Uh, okay, okay, I'm recommending it. And Melissa, you weren't here um, yet, but Strange Little Horrors by Amy Cross. If you read no other story in there, read the story sitcom. Oh, I read that. We talked. Wouldn't we talk about that? I love. I thought that was really good. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can't talk about it now. I won't talk it, about it. Like, yeah, yeah but I. But I would love to talk like to that. you about it on a spoiler. Yeah. Free, you know, on a spoiler filled discussion sometime definitely and maybe we'll invite pete you know you never know <laughs> <laughs> he'll probably disagree with us no matter what we say anyway i don't know so so anyway uh uh let's see what else do we have okay this is fun third this is july the 18th 2021 apparently 13 years ago today, The Dark Knight was released. What does this have to do with Ron Malfi? Well, I will tell you. Apparently, and I found this out for the first time today, I have DC Infinite. I'm going to be reading it tonight. Uh, DC's House of Horrors yeah. came out in 2017. 
And apparently you have a green arrow story in there. Is I that right? Do. I do have a green arrow. I was wondering where you were going with that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can segue that. this, man. Yeah. Yeah. So he no, just I wanted. To, oh, I'm sorry. He just had to add Batman in there somehow. Well, we always but, okay. have to bring Batman in at some point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Good segue. Fair enough. No, that was uh, it was that was such a that was a blast to do. Um, I got who? How, how did that come about? So Brian Keen, the horror writer, uh, I'm friends with him, and he was he he was he's always been doing he's always had his hands in the comic book stuff, and uh, he wound up getting this House of Horror thing done through one of the, um, or I think it was, was it Keith Griffin. I'm not a comic book guy, so, yeah, right. you know. But, um, so one of the guys he knew that worked over at DC was putting, he, they came up with the idea for this project. It was, I want to say like seven or eight horror writers would write the story to their, to whatever character they were assigned. They'd give them an artist, they'd work on the project together, and then they, they would collect it in this House of Horrors uh, graphic novel. And um, man, it was awesome. I mean, I, you know, they, they, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the most interesting part about it is, first of all, how they, how they worked it. So they told me the green arrow. I'm like, cool. All right. Um, let me figure out who this guy is. I'm not, you know, not too well versed. Um, and then they, the right, the, the artist sent me, the panel sketches i want to say it's 10 the story's like 10 pages i think and uh he sent me the sketches before the story was there i'm like what how does this work and yeah. he's like well, he, he said uh what do you think like when you look at this what story do you think is taking place I'm like that's interesting so it, it might just have been how they did it with me or with with this particular project i don't i can't imagine they always do it that way but i thought that was interesting so but so then the hurdle then was to write, it's, you know, it's a comic book, so it's mostly dialogue, to write the dialogue that I felt told this story. And, and I had a false start doing it because I realized I'm writing what's already on the page. Like your, your first inclination is to, you know, write what you see, you know? And then I'm like, no, no, no. It, it, it wasn't working for some reason. I couldn't figure out why. So then I pulled back from it. And I'm like, no, the, the pictures are already telling their story. That's how I read it. I've got to add the, another layer, another story through the dialogue that carries us through. And that and it kind of clicked like a light bulb. I'm like, ah, that's how comics are done. This That makes sense to me. So it's kind of two things going on at once. So and, that, yeah. that method, it's a variation of the Marvel method that Stanley developed. Is that is that true? Yeah, I, I, I'd never done one, something like that before. And, uh, and it... Uh, it was actually easy for me. I mean, you know, the writer is doing more more work than than the. Are, 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 are you a comics guy? Or are you a DC guy? I'm really not. You know, I mean, I, I I didn't really read comics when I was a kid. It's funny because I love to draw and I love to read, but I, mm -hmm. you know, the combination of the two just never translated to me. Um, and you know, and I loved all the the old, you know, I, you know, I'm like I. I was born in 77. So I, you know, the old Superman and, and the, you know, Michael Keaton, Batman, and that stuff was cool. But I'm like a little superheroed out, I think, at this point. <laughs> so yeah, that can, the, that can happen. The original method was Stan had an idea and would give it to the artist, and then the artist would make a story that Stan would write around it. Yeah. And then, and then the artist got so good at it, the artist would just come up with the idea himself. And Stan would fill out the dialogue and get the characters' names or whatever. That's that's wild. See, I did not know that, and I I thought I was probably just because they were hand holding me because I'd never done this before. But maybe that yeah, all right. That sounds I believe well, it. But here's um here's what you linked to in 2017 from your mm -hmm. Twitter account. I, I I just stumbled across this, but I'm really happy that I did because I can't wait to read this tonight. I, I'm a huge DC fan. Mm -hmm. Um, you know I, Melissa, I like Batman. If you didn't know, uh, so. I'm, I'm reading from DC Comics from 2017 uh, blog entry. When you think about it, superheroes are awfully scary. I mean, just look at the Justice League. You have an all-powerful alien capable of shooting beams from his eyes that can melt metal. A speedster who has a habit of messing with our history and altering the, altering the timeline in the process, usually fucking it up. A young man who can access and take control of every computer network in the world within a matter of seconds. A woman who's strong enough to toss a tank and can make you confess all your deepest secrets. 
uh, two dubious, dubiously responsible individuals who wield the most powerful weapons ever created. Uh, this must be the incarnation of the League with the two Green Lanterns, uh, not Hal Jordan. And, of course, Batman, the man who pretty much defines terror. So, you know, this is sort of their setup. And I was like, I, yeah, I have to read this. So, yeah. No, it's uh, it was fun, man. It was a good time. It was something different. It was like trying something new that I've never done before. And I think I think they wanted to do a, the idea was to do it every Halloween, but I, I don't know how many zombies. Life happens, right? Yeah, zombie Batman <laughs> stories. You could, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it was cool though. Um, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but you have a band, right? I do have a band. Yeah, you're you're a rock star. Uh, I am. Not so much a star, and we kind of sort of rock, I guess. You're an aspiring rock star. <laughs> we, we do it, man. We do it for fun. It's like my version of playing golf. We uh, you have a you have a, a music video on YouTube called I'm sorry, uh, yeah. We've got a couple of music videos out. The last, the latest one's called Red Tide. The band is Veer, yeah. Veer, V E E R, V E E R, yeah. Okay, um, and uh, I, I looked at what's what's the name of the other video. Uh, there's one called Breathe. There's one called um, I can't remember which ones we did videos for. Breathe. Is it I, I, I think I must have seen Red Tide, and I thought it was very professionally produced. Uh, you know what? Here, here, bring us back full circle. That knucklehead chatting in the box, Kevin Kangas, he directed that video <laughs> for us. So yeah. Glad you're here, Kevin. Glad you're here. <laughs> and then we had to fix it. Oh, oh, I love this guy <laughs> even more. I just went back on the comments. He says, I agree with your uh, opinion, Reek. Lovecraft, Lovecraft country. <laughs> he must be talking about me. So, um, or maybe not. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Tell us about the band real quick. And then I've got a couple of last questions for you. Yeah, man. Maybe so, other two too. Like I said, I was always into music. I was in, uh, you know, while I was trying to put off getting a real job while I was coming out of college with my writing, I kind of did the same thing about when I was going into college with music and I was in a band that, you know, we'd like toward the East coast for a couple of years and, and we, you know, were fairly legit. Um, and then, you know, I went to college, started writing, got married, had kids and like 15, whatever years later, uh, I never thought I'd play again, but my brother, who's our drummer, my brother, uh, owns a, uh, custom guitar company. So he builds guitars, even though he's a drummer um for other musicians pretty you know fam- you know popular guys probably some names you'd know and he would ha- have this annual festival then as the company got bigger where these guys would come in so for one of his artists my brother and i backlined his set on stage we played and then after we both got off the show we looked at each- the stage we looked at each other like why aren't we doing this man this is fun. right <laughs> so right. we did we we uh you know, um got my the guitarist from my old band is like one of my best friends. And then a bass player that we were friends with, we threw together some songs and we, we, we wound up, we got in a really lucky little niche where we don't really even have to drive too far. We just play really Maryland, DC, Virginia area. And we open for any of the major national acts that come through like on, on tour, we open for them and we don't have to do a lot of work and we have a blast and play in front of a bunch of people. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good time. That's awesome, man. That's those are the memories you're going to look back on. Absolutely, it's you know, you know like that it, writing your family. Um, it's that's, that's what it's I really about. get to hang out with my my friends and stuff. You know, other you know, everybody's busy. You know, we all got got a lot of stuff going on. So that's sort of my outlet. Uh, uh, so, Ron. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Are there still a string of brassy pubs uh, on the on the uh, islands through Ocean City, Maryland, and Delmarva? Brassy. Oh, uh, are they the ones with the, they have those? Is it the pawn shop balls out front? Yes. Yes. Well, there's, I know of one. I don't know how many. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That was a, my misspent youth. Oh, yeah, man. Well, you, bar questions. I'm good at those. <laughs> uh, anyone else have any last questions for Ron? And then I've got one last question that to kind of segue into uh, the next section of the, sh- of the show. Nobody? Okay, Ron, name some of your favorite horror movies. I warned you this was... Yeah, you did warn me. Coming. That's tough, I, depending on which day you get me. Um, so my all-time the favorite... Same, yeah, is, same here. Same here. Yeah. My all-time favorite is probably Poltergeist. Um, the remake 
No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, uh, the original Poltergeist. Yeah, I, that my my tradition is after Halloween night, I get the kids to bed, I watch Poltergeist, and I eat an entire box of Frankenberry cereal, and that's my Halloween. Um, <laughs> and I'm thinking about doing that as at like a like a convention kind of style thing, you know. But uh, love, I love Poltergeist. Uh, you pr- it's probably the same horror movies. I'm, I'm trying to think of something that would be out of the ordinary. Um, I love the I love the uh, the William was it William Cat movie uh, House House yeah. yeah love that movie yeah um, it's really good and probably most of it, I mean there's there's some great horror movies uh, but probably the ones that I like the best just have some kind of nostalgia or personal you know reference for me growing up you know yeah I, fair enough like Friday the Thirteenth like my favorite Friday the Thirteenth movie is Jason Takes Manhattan only because I was like probably at that perfect stupid age to watch that movie. And I remember renting it at a video store when I was spending, I was a, I was a little kid, but I was spending like the summer with my grandparents and my grandfather let me rent it. And well, we were watching it. And next thing you know, there's a pair of tits jiggling across the screen. And my grandfather's like, Ronald, what is this movie? <laughs> I'm like, no, it gets better. This guy's going to start killing people. So what about, yeah. uh, what, what, what about Fright Night? Is that nostalgia? Oh, I love, you? I love Fright Night. Oh yeah. yeah. Speaking of the the ultimate horror nostalgia movie, you know. Oh yeah, and you know what? I love uh, I love, I love Gremlins. I got my kid, my daughter, my seven year old daughter carries around a Gizmo doll. I mean, your friends don't even know what that is, but yeah. So it, no, Judd Shepard was I was saying his gateway uh, horror movie was Gremlins. So, so last week we were in Orlando for a thing, and. Uh, we went to Old Town, and there's a there's a Chinese pawn shop in Old Town, and they have a gizmo in <laughs> oh the window. Oh my god! And we're like, hey, that's there, right? awesome. <laughs> we have to go in here. <laughs> that is cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, what about uh, um, some? I don't know if I want to say say authors because you know it, it's it's so easy to leave somebody that you really love out yeah. when you're on the spot like that. But maybe some some horror books that you really love that you've read lately, or that it's been a while that you've read that you that, that you that you like a lot. Uh, probably one of the best ones I've read lately was uh, the Stephen Graham Jones, uh, "The Only Good Indians." I thought that was outstanding. Yeah, um, and that was sort of. Yeah, I, I heard I heard mixed. I heard people who hated it, people who loved it, and I'm of the personal belief that if you hated it, you're just you don't know how to read books good because <laughs> that is a good. Oh, book. really? I didn't hear much of the hated it variety. Yeah, uh, yeah I heard some. Well, people were complaining. Like they, I, I don't know if they did just didn't get it, but I mean, to me, that's what. And I and I find I I put you know like Paul Tremblay in, in this camp, um, and and writers of, of that ilk where it's you know. The, we shouldn't have to point out the fact that oh, this is elevated horror. This is better. You know, everything should be elevated. <laughs> everything should be right. good. You know, and and but I think those guys do it right. I think it's you know it it that was such a great book. It spoke to me, and I think the how he handled it was just just stellar. Just really, really freaking good. Um, you know, yeah, I'm speaking of guy. speaking of Stephen guys, um, if you if you've been watching the Fear Street trilogy on on netflix uh or even if you haven't um i want to point out that stephen graham jones has a free to read story on um uh, on juked.com uh and you actually you can just find it if you if you type in this is the title of the story i was a teenage slasher victim it's a short story so type in I was into Google. I was a I was a teenage slasher victim by Stephen Graham Jones. Probably take you right to it. So since you brought up Stephen, so yeah. So man. what others do you want to mention before we <clears throat> stop interrogating you? Well, I mean, it seems I don't think Stephen King needs the publicity. Uh, you know, I love I love. I, no, he'll he'll get there someday if he keeps working um, hard. Yeah. <laughs> I am a huge, unapologetic Peter Straub fan. I think he is the fucking best. Um, you know, I, I I don't get starstruck by many people, but I did meet him at one of the was it Stoker or World Horror Convention, and I saw, my wife and I are sitting there, and I can see him and his wife having dinner. And I'm like, that's him. I said, I don't want to be that guy and just go over and 
introduce myself. I said, ah, I'm not going to do it. So then he, they leave and like he's waiting for his wife to come out of the restroom in the hallway of the, the hotel. I'm like, I'm going to go over. So I go like, Mr. Straub, my, my name's Ron. I'm, I'm the biggest fan. I love your work. And I was like a blithering idiot. And he's like, oh, you have very good taste in books. <laughs> That's funny. You're, you're I was very on a, I was Straubian. On a, very Straubian. <laughs> yeah. I was on a panel with him at, uh, I think it was Necronomicon. Either mm -hmm. that or at HP Lovecraft Film Festival. Necronomicon. Necronomicon, yeah. So, and then, of course, uh, unlike some people, uh, you know, creatives that I like, I don't, I don't spend the entire convention stalking them and mm -hmm. trying to get their signature on on things. But uh, uh, I, I won't mention who that is. Are you flipping <laughs> me off, Rolick? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, okay. I'm just okay. scratching my head with half a peace sign. <laughs> uh so huge huge peter straub fan anybody else you want to mention before we uh yeah. i just got the new philip fracassi my short story collection um oh well, I'm getting i'm good friends with him are you he's a great he writer doesn't have any friends he lied to me uh and, one, or, and, one or two i mean he pays me he's a great writer man his uh, yeah he is uh behold the void uh, that's a great collection i'm gonna have him i'm gonna have him I was supposed to have him and Cody Goodfellow on at the same time uh, last Sunday, and I was I was very very sick, and I feel really bad about it. I I actually emailed Philip and Cody today, and I said let's do a a public Patreon. I'm really booked up for the rest of the year on Sundays, but let's do a pay, public Patreon sometime during the week in the next couple of weeks. Um, Laird wants to be there, and let's put all three all four of our schedules together and and make it happen so mm -hmm. so uh, i i love yeah. all three of those guys of course with cody all you have to do is say this is the lovecraft teasing podcast and these are my guests and this is cody and then i don't have to say anything else so. <laughs> now nah, they're they're, I, they're, all, they're all great they're all three very all wonderful people yeah yeah they really are yeah so. we talked about paul tremley his, his work is awesome his short story yeah. is fantastic um and then uh and Josh a nice guy. Mallerman, Josh Mallerman's doing cool stuff. He's a nice guy. Um, and Greg Gafune, he's probably one of my personal favorites. And if you've ever read any Greg Gafune. Oh, I have, yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah, what's that one that's set in where the, the, the four guys spend the night in a cabin? In, uh, in, Deep Night. That was, Deep my first, night. that was my first book of his that I read, yeah. That was my first book of his that I read, and it was very disturbing for me. It was I, I, it's so disturbing. To this day, I think. I love uh -huh. it. Yeah, it's it's a disturbing book. And I, I mean that as a compliment. Mm -hmm. No, he's so. great. You talk about a moody, depressive, atmospheric writer. That guy is just top. Yeah. Yeah, he really is. Um, anything else that we didn't cover? Um, or anything else anybody else wants to say before we before we let you go, Ron? Uh, not just to reiterate that Come With Me comes out. Tuesday, July 20th should be in all the bookstores and actually I think it snuck out early if they do that sometimes. And uh, can can they can people go on Amazon now and, and pre-order it? Oh sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I, I I will I'll tell you um guys, I've started this book. I'm halfway through this book and I really really love it. I love the premise. I love the writing. I love what's going on. Um and it means a lot to a publisher and to a writer mm -hmm. when um, uh, people, um, sorry, I just lost the word. That happens to my brain sometimes. When people pre-order. Yeah, you know what? Because, that's, yeah. That's a great point. Most people who aren't in the industry don't realize that. But you're, as a, as a writer, you, they look at the pre-order sales to determine how they're going to promote and if yes. they you for any additional books. So, yeah. You know, it, it's, a, it's a it's a huge sign of encouragement for them and as a result for the writer so if you like ron's work um please do pre-order um uh, uh come with me uh you know whether that's the audible the print the kindle so sure yeah i appreciate it thank you yeah well thanks for being on the show ron uh oh, you're more than welcome to stay but i know you have two kids also so yeah, I gotta go beat him up. I could hear him jumping around. <laughs> but no, I appreciate Mike. Thanks for having me on. It was yeah, great thank to talk you, to everybody.
Appreciate it. Take care. All right. Enjoy the rest of your night. Bye. Bye. All right. Hey, for those who do not know, Jeffrey Thomas, we all know this guy, his incredible, incredible Punk Town series. Uh, this should be a at least a limited series on Amazon Prime or Hulu or Netflix or some such place. It's such an intricate world universe. Uh, Lovecraftian, weird, horror, uh, all kinds of things. Um, I and I beg your pardon? I got to play in it once. You got it, to what? So it wrote a story. I wrote a story for, set in Pucktown for her. Oh, right. There was a tribute anthology, wasn't there? There, there were two tribute anthologies. That's how you know you made it, um, Jeff. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, in the show comments, if memory serves, um, it, it, these books are now available on Kindle Unlimited. And you can just, I've linked to it. You can just go there, read them in order. And I, I, I just highly recommend that you do so. This was my first introduction to, to Jeffrey Thomas years before I knew him. And I thought, what the hell? I've never read anything like this before. This is insane. This is great. So um, uh, if you haven't started Punk Town or if you've just read the first one or you just vaguely know about it, uh, uh, I'm, pe I'm being paid no advertising dollars to say this. Jeff's a friend, but he's also, he's a friend now. He's been a friend for 10 years, but he's also just a really, really great writer and Punk Town I think is his ultimate creation. So, um, and um, so check the show notes and, and click over and read those. And, um, you know, after you do send, send Jeff a note and, and or write a review on Amazon. Um, writers love that. So uh, I was going to ask Matt about the Vanacourt, Vanna Court book of horror stories. But I will save that till next week since Matt's not here. Uh, anybody see the Tomorrow War? I did. Yes. Did you like it? I don't think it deserves a sequel. Thank you. I agree. I mean, it was it was kind of fun, but it was super cliche. Yeah, I mean, I could I, the whole time I knew he was going to meet his adult. No, oh, never mind. I shouldn't say that. Yeah, but it was pretty obvious, you know. But I think you could almost go through that film scene by scene and find what previous film that scene had been listed, lifted from. Like there are scenes there. There's a scene straight out of uh, Starship Troopers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, yeah. It, it's, I'm like, it's like. Wait, I've seen this before. The best part of this movie is that J.K. Simmons got buffed. Yeah. For this. Yeah. There are, there the, are other that's... scenes that are straight out of um, The Thing, both the original and the remake. Yeah. Um, and, and so forth and so on. It's just... So I was in the mood for... Uh, speaking of dumb popcorn movies, here's another one. I was in the mood for a dumb popcorn movie yesterday morning, just trying to wake up, not feeling too great. And I thought, I, I can't stand Mark Wahlberg. But I've been seeing these ads for the, for the Infinite on Amazon Prime. It's, you know, it's free if you have mm -hmm. Prime. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. So I watched it. This is what I'll say about the Infinite. It starts off with a really great, car chase scene okay and then the infinite spends an infinite amount of time convincing the main character who he really is which as the viewer you know from the beginning so it's all wasted time and then when, once he finally figures out who he is there's about 15 minutes of action and the movie's over hmm. and in other words do not waste your time i broke my mark Wahlberg rule 
which enforces why I have the Mark Wahlberg rule. Um, anybody there else see it? Films we don't, you don't need to watch because we've watched them for you. Yeah, and I never thought I would say that, but I'll, I'm saying that about the Tomorrow War and the Infinite, or Infinite, or whatever it, the hell it is. Speaking of dumb popcorn movies, did anybody ever watch Boss Level on Hulu? I loved that movie. <laughs> I, 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 liked it. It. I, I, I liked it a lot. <laughs> What's it? Yeah. Wait, what was it called? Boss level. Boss, Boss level. It's, level. It starts right. the guy who plays Crossbones in uh, the in uh, right. Captain America. Oh, I tried watching Gunpowder Milkshake last night and didn't get very far. So. I think I saw on Laird's Twitter that he liked it. I could be Gun wrong. Gunpowder Milkshake. I'm either wrong or right. I'll tell you that right now. Um, Reminder, I have a Patreon. Thank you to all the new Patreons lately. And I just was reminded of this because Hector Plasmic just wrote on the live chat uh, that Scott Thomas story you recently posted on Patreon was amazing. Yes, Jeffrey Thomas has a brother. His name is Scott, as we all know, probably. And Scott writes uh, different stories. I might You might call them sort of autumn Halloween, haunting stories uh i'm not saying he's a better writer than jeff i'm not saying jeff's a better writer than scott they're different kinds of horror writers okay so scott is such a wonderful guy and um for my five dollar and up patrons you get access to every single patreon podcast i mean it, it's just I, I think you get a lot for a little bit of money uh especially since i, I just talked to Paul Tremblay and Nadia Bolkin about Lake Mungo a couple weeks ago. And I just talked to, to Laird about strange but true chilling things that have happened to him. I don't know if you guys, I don't have that, it on audio yet, but I saw it on YouTube. I, that I've got was it amazing. YouTube. I have to say, like listening to him tell those stories, like I was just like totally enraptured. And I was like, oh my gosh. It's, like yeah. just, he's a great storyteller. I mean, yeah. Yes, we were on yeah. what started this is we were on the phone a couple of weeks ago. So we're talking about anything and everything. And then we get on this strange but true stuff that have happened to us. And so he like starts telling me this stuff. And I was like, what the fuck? And, you know, Larry's not really given to hyperbole. So I was like, Larry, you know, we should do a Patreon podcast and you should tell this stuff. And he's like, yeah, that'd be fun. So we did that. And um, so you get a really some really cool stuff for just five bucks a month. But when you get to 10 bucks a month, you get things like uh, free uh, Patreon only stories like the, uh, Rick wrote a story for us a few months back. Pete wrote a story for us a few months back. I don't believe people have seen either one of those stories. I just posted a Scott Thomas story that he gave me permission to post that nobody's ever seen. Scott said he wrote this story in the same room, the same house as uh, the Sea of Ash. Mm. Um, so, uh, and then there's levels beyond that where you get even even more cool stuff. So thank you for reminding me, Hector. Um, I, I, I do have the link at, actually at the very top of the show notes, but you know, if you're listening in the car or something, all you gotta do uh, when you pull over or stop or whatever, if you if you want to keep the Lovecraft easing going, just Google Lovecraft easing Patreon and, and you'll see the choices and, and all the cool stuff. So, so yeah, Laird, it, it was a great discussion with Paul and Nadia. Laird was just chilling. I've had several people tell me that they listened to that twice and I don't even have the audio version up yet, just the YouTube version. And, um, and we got some more great stuff coming. So what are we doing this coming Thursday, Rick, and possibly Pete. Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper, right. Pete, In I forgot to ask. Fiction. You're going to join us, right, Pete? Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot in a while. Like, what do I, I know just, about Jack the Ripper? I thought you knew everything. No. I, I know nothing my, about Jack the Ripper. I can do it, I can do it by myself. <laughs> I know lies about Jack the Ripper. Yeah, like the Masonic conspiracy is one of the biggest yeah. lies. Basically, the vast majority of stuff is lies. But well, how would you know that if you don't know the truth? 
Look, the Jeez. truth is that Are Jack you, Ripper you, was five infant children born from uh, Mr. Hyde raping prostitutes. Great. We don't have to have the podcast now. There you go. All right, but we are going to have the podcast. Um, Pete, uh, with the amount of money that I pay you, um, I would expect you there. Um, I'll see what I can do. (laughs) I'm going to go over the facts and then popular fiction. I'm going to listen. (laughs) And just, I want to mention all the popular conspiracies that end up coming in the fiction. And we have to touch on Whitechapel season one. Yeah. Well, that will also be that kind of went, there's a new trend that to pick up some guy that, you know, was just living in the neighborhood to find somebody who's mentioned a president, one of the murders. There are about three or four suspects who popped up popular, popular speculation now. So that's this coming Thursday. Every other Thursday, we do a Patreon podcast, 9 Eastern. Um, for those at the $5 level and up, every other Thursday, other than that, we do a just a hangout with us and the patrons, panelists and patrons and, and so forth. So, um, and that's not broadcast or recorded. We're just, we're just hanging out. Can I ask a question? Probably not, but I guess. Bridget, where are you? She's outside. I'm outside. I, I'm being you in, fancy today. Are you in Colorado or are you in California? Yes. Okay. No, I'm in Colorado still. Till the end of the month. All right. Just checking. It I'm looks trying awful. to figure out. I'm like, does she have a fan in front of her, like blowing her hair? Like, I was like, wow. I was like, what's going on? It's, it's just the Colorado like, wins yeah. that I ordered. <laughs> I just, I just like, realized I thought you were like in a bright room with like uh, the window open, but I can yeah, see yeah. now. Yeah, like, I, I don't I, have, I, have that production team yet. Bridget's <laughs> like, I, I have become a model. Do you see my hair blowing? Like, uh, gonna... oh, I, I thought her uh, microphones made her look like Julie Newmar. Yes, yeah, so that's like what that. I. You're yeah, right. <laughs> you are. Yeah, that's right. Oh my god. All right, so I, I stole this you. from my son actually <laughs> for today. It's very keep nice. it. You got to so keep first, it. I think I like yeah, them. For the good. first 20 minutes, I thought it was an effect. Oh, I, for got, the like, first Snapchat 20 filter. seconds, I thought it was an effect. <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> that's funny. All right, so I emailed you guys and asked you to come up with a list. It didn't have to be a huge list of your yes. favorite horror movies. Um, he probably ignored me, but maybe everybody else did it. Uh, I'm picking on you a lot today, aren't I? You are. Is it because, <laughs> has anybody noticed that I'm burned? That my eyes are have white rings around them and my whole face is red? It's yeah, I, I have noticed. I was out now that you mention it. I know don't why. Use... I don't need to ask you why. Yeah. Why so, aren't you wearing sunblock? I was wearing sunblock. Welcome wow. to Florida. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so anyway okay here's my list i want to emphasize this is not complete and this is my list today okay uh it could change if you ask me next week but here's my list of favorite horror movies i know i'm missing some it follows is the first one this is no particular order uh, I usually I usually do not like slashers, but Scream. I love Scream. Uh, Absentia. Um, the Fog. Everyone's surprised there, right? With my new background there on on YouTube. You guys are shocked, right? Uh, the New Daughter. Uh, Ponty Pool. The Devil's Backbone. What Lies Beneath. The Ninth Gate and Session Nine, and again, I'm I'm not done with the list, but that's that's what I have right now. A- anybody else want to go? Good. Sure. <laughs> I'm like, who's gonna jump? I don't know. I'll go. What? Oh, Rick. I, I, I'm a 
creature. Of, I was raised in the 60s, so whenever it was on television, it was not my favorite. Because my favorite Universal movie was uh, Son of Frankenstein. My favorite Hammer is uh, Horror of Dracula. My favorite William Castle movie is The Tingler. And my favorite Roger Corman and Allan Poe movie is The Pit and the Pendulum. Those are my favorites, my category. Nice. Bridget? So I like what Ron said about like favorite movies kind of have nostalgia reasons or, you know, various reasons for why picking them. Um, right. So uh, some of these are interesting. It was interesting seeing everyone's list too and seeing that for a lot of us being, you know, cosmic horror fans that there weren't many cosmic horror movies that were on our favorites list, but we have high standards, I think is what it is. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, there's not a lot of good cosmic horror movies. I mean, no, it's there's really very hard. few. It's hard to uh, do. I've got yes. Avalanche on there. Yeah, Absentia is really good. I guess the closest one on my list is The Thing, because I like that. Um, Alien, Friday the 13th, Halloween, uh, the 1931 Frankenstein, Night of the Living Dead. Uh, and this one is totally like personal. Uh, the Bride, 1985. Probably watched that movie five million times because I like Sting as Victor Frankenstein. And uh, House on Haunted Hill, cause uh, the Shining and Envision of Body Snatchers, the 1978. Which There's else? way more with I could Leonard, put on there. With Leonard Nimoy. The 1978 of Donald Sutherland. With Leonard Nimoy's in it. Let Leonard Nimoy's in it. Yeah. Oh, that's what I thought. Yeah. He's a side character. Which house on Haunted Hill is your favorite? Oh, the 1959. Okay. Definitely. Vincent Price. Vincent Price. Yeah. Got to be Vincent Price. All right. Who, who's next? I like really struggled with this because my list is so long and I have to, I, I okay. keep adding to it when Ronald Malpice this came on and I'm like, oh my God, Gremlins and Poltergeist, they were my favorites too. Like I, like yes. a lot of my favorites <laughs> are in the 80s because that's when I grew up and I was like young enough that the stuff seemed like really scary at the time. But um, I have some other things too and it's it's hard because I think with like horror movies, you can almost have themes like favorite zombie movie, favorite ghost story. Like there's so many different categories of horror. So this That's is true. very difficult. So I'm just going to try to read a few off of my list because my list keeps getting longer and longer. But um, The Beyond by uh, Fulci, Nightmare on Elm Street, Lost Boys, Carnival of Souls, let the Right One In, Annihilation, The Thing, The Shining, and Pan's Labyrinth, although I guess that could be more of a dark fantasy, but I just, it's like one of my favorite movies. Yeah, that's so I fine. To add that in. That's all. <laughs> I, I would like to read Mike DeBronzos because he's one of my patrons. You guys know him very well. One of the nicest guys that I know. He emailed me a list. We're we're actually gonna when you guys finalize all these, we're gonna I'll do a blog post and, and put everybody's up. Uh, Mike emailed me his. So thank you, Mike. Here is here's Mike DeBronzo's list. An American Werewolf in London, uh, Night of the Living Dead, 1968, Alien, uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. John Carpenter's Halloween, The Haunting, 1963, Night of the Demon, 1957, The Shining, Dracula, 1931, and The Thing from Another World. So th those are Mike's. So, hey, you're welcome, Mike. Thank you. Uh, Pete, you're oh, the only one Pete, left. Pete, 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 Pete. Yeah. Speech. I haven't heard him at all. Like we, we don't know anything. We didn't yeah. like get discuss it. It's gonna be a uh, total surprise. He didn't yeah. even post it in the chat. He was I being know. all was secretive. Like actually, actually, he's <laughs> coming up with it on the fly right now. Nope. Nope. You got it written down. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. 
All right. So the first one's kind of a dark horse. Rear window. Mm. Most people yeah. think it's a killer. I think of it, I it's actually my favorite movie of all time, and I think it fits. Really? I, I like the thematic sequel, which is an Australian film starring Jamie Lee Curtis called and Stacy Keach called Road Games. Okay. Uh Assault on Precinct 13. It's my oh, wow. Film. Did you get my email Old about school. that today? I did. Yeah, Laird said something about uh, Assault on Precinct 13 as a horror movie. Yep. And on, on Twitter. And I replied, Pete Relic says that's a zombie movie. And Laird's like, I'm going to have to agree with that. I'm paraphrasing Laird, but he said something along that, yeah. those lines. So, yep, uh, Assault on Precinct 13, The Abominable Dr. Fives, <laughs> Creature from the Black Lagoon. 13 Ghosts, Reanimator. Of Cards. course. I wonder yeah, why. I was like, I knew that was going to be on his list. It could not he be. He stole a car to get to see it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. If you, don't, if you don't include the movie that you stole a car to go watch, That's then right. this is not a valid list. Horror Express. <laughs> with Tony Savannah. Oh, man. Really I should have added that. You're right. Horror Express, which it's you know, one. more and more people are agreeing that that it is a it is a um, production of uh, Who Goes There. Um, so that leads us yeah. to the thing. Yeah, uh, Island of Terror. Which yeah, is, Peter Cushing. Yep. Uh, From Beyond, Phantasm. Mm. No. My trilogy of uh, J horror, fr- uh, fa- uh, the Ring, Shutter, and the Eye, though some of that's K horror. Um, a film that I saw once when I was younger, and I somebody of really Jason Wallach, I believe, sent me a copy of Extro, um, which was this video nasty that came out after ET. It's sort of a horrible version of ET. Yeah. Um, the Gorgon, which is what Hammer House of Horror. Yes, you could, only time one of the few times we see a good guy in a Hammer movie. Yep, She Creature, which is a B movie, but that I simply love, and um, something that I'm really surprised that I put on this list. But Killer Clowns from Outer Space. I right. love. I, I, for, I forgot Bubba Hotep. Oh my gosh, that, that yeah, movie's yeah, hilarious. Yeah. But is that really a horror movie? Like, would you consider that a horror movie? It's a horror comedy movie, which I okay. usually can't stand. Right. But it's done so well there. Really? there are, we could also add Army of Darkness. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. like horror comedy. I mean, Evil Dead is great. But Army of Darkness, you're getting to comedy. Well, Army of Darkness is the one you can watch over and over. Yeah. I it's really seen. good. <laughs> and let's not forget Cabin in the Woods. And Cabin in the Woods, uh, Dale and Tucker versus Evil. I, I would love to have like these, those are those two films are like post horror for me. It's like they deal with the tropes of horror as core to their their existence, but they're not really horror films. They're more com- they're more comedies about horror. Mm-hmm. So. Anyway, that's yeah, we could def- we could definitely discuss like each subgenre and pick up. Yeah, because <laughs> there's, like, there's a lot like Shaun of the Dead, like or yeah, like Shaun of the Dead. Oh my like, god, I love Shaun you know? of the Dead. Like, but it's not really. Ho- is it horror? It's horror. It's horror comedy. Well, that's you know? what the that's part of the Coronetto trilogy, right? Yeah. Well, there's red on you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, so there's yeah. So, yeah. But yeah it's uh, good I'm film. sorry, Pete. Go ahead. No, it's it's fine. It's a good film. That's all. Uh, I, I want to recommend a movie that I have not seen. I was on a, I, I got to get on this. This, I, I've been on Clubhouse recently. Jed invited me. Um, it's really neat. It's like this app for your phone. And you can, it's basically voice chats about whatever. Um, Jed hosts horror stuff. I, I think I might start a Lovecraft zine discussion you know you can basically just schedule hey we're going to talk at this time it re- it's really 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 informal um i don't want to spread myself too thin that's my only but but clubhouse just seems so cool anyway i was in a clubhouse uh meeting with jed last week and 
it wasn't Jed, but it was somebody, one of the other speakers recommended a movie, uh, a, a Thai movie called Take Me Home, uh, 2016. And they did not spoil it for us, but they just could not say enough good things about it. So I, I put it on my, on my watch list. Uh, looks like it's available on Tubi, which means, you know, limited ads, but who cares about that? It looks like it's also available on Amazon um, to rent. So um, for anyone listening out there, for you guys, if you haven't seen it, you know, check it out. Let me know what you think. I'm going to um, re- recommend two movies. All right, go ahead. The first is Vigil, which is on Hulu right now. Oh, I loved it. It's so tight, right? Yeah. Right. First of all, it's it, first of all, it's very, very dark. They could almost have filled it in black and white. And it reminded me a bit of a Jeff Ford story called Sith Dead. Yeah. Um, it is about a Short guy story. who's hired to shit uh, to sit Shomer for a dead body. And it really delves deep into uh, which is a, a Jewish tradition. Jewish traditions and, yes. uh, and Jewish horror. Yes. It was really good. And the ending was like, you have to watch all the way to the end because it is very reminiscent of It Follows. Yeah. Which I um, love. Yeah, it... Uh, and it solves one of the problems of, okay, in horror movies, why don't these idiots leave the house? There's a very specific reason why this guy doesn't leave the house. You know? So, yes, it's not because he can't, it's because he won't, no matter what's going on. Right. Um, the other film I'm going to recommend, and I can't believe I'm doing this because I, if I start a film and I see the uncorked label come across, I refuse to watch it. The I what? Just, uncorked. It's a production company. Okay. And they just, I don't think they do good films and it's not worth my time. However, Based on somebody else's recommendation, I watched a Bigfoot movie called Monstrous. This must be Rick or nope, Rich. Rich nope, Bunting. Nope. No, it's not. Okay. And um, I was pleasantly surprised. It's called um, what again? Monstrous. Okay. And... Uh, the the effects are pretty good the acting is pretty good and the storyline is tremendous because the bigfoot is a red herring is this uh found footage it is not found footage good so i i was really impressed with it so that's my recommendation for recent films all right anybody else before we go has anybody else seen all three of the Fear Street? Yes. I did. They were I enjoyable, but I'm not going to recommend them. I'm going to have to go ahead and disagree with that. <sighs> well, you, you can, but you're wrong. I like to, well, you know, as I said, I don't typically like slasher movies, but this is a supernatural slasher movie. Now, I thought the weakest of the three was the second one, though still enjoyable. Uh, and I thought the third one was going to be even worse and it pleasantly surprised me yeah i it, I, I, I just thought it was fun they were they were fun other um, than the 1666 part which really bothered me for reasons you know that i won't get into so right now i will say that with some you know i was kind of trying you know I was trying to figure out why they were rated R. And then there were... there Besides was Besides all the people chopping up people? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, for for the first hour and 20 minutes of, of the first film, I'm just, I'm trying to think, why is this rated R? And, and then the, the, the grocery store scene happens. So there you go. You earn mm-hmm. your... I, I did not see that coming. Yeah, well, you know what? You're right. I expected more people to survive and because I thought it was a Goosebumps film. And it's not a Goosebumps film. <laughs> it's, it's an adult no. R.L. Stein film. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the second film basically takes us into a kind of supernatural Friday the 13th. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they really, I mean, they paid homage to Scream. They played homage to Friday the 13th. Yep. Was it Friday the 13th Supernatural to begin with? Mm, no. no. Oh, maybe, maybe not, not to begin had, with. Oh, the first one you're talking about. Yeah, the first one. Okay. Um, I almost wish that the third movie had been split in two. Mm, you know, they could easily have yeah. done, you know, four films. You know. That's true. And, and keep in mind, that fourth film was two hours long. Yeah, I noticed that. So. But. Uh, anyway. Uh, it, it was um, enjoyable, but. You the know. bad, the, who the bad guy was in 1666, and I really don't want to spoil this, was who, from personal experience, I expected to be the bad guy. You know yep. who I'm talking about. Yep. Mm-hmm. And he couldn't have been nicer, and he was not the bad guy. So, um, you know, until something happened to him. But you know what I mean. Yeah. The, that I, was I, not his fault. I, I think as an author and a, as a horror aficionado, I kind of figured out who the bad guy in the whole tri- uh, trilogy was. And that it kind should of, have been obvious from the beginning. Yeah. yeah but I was blinded I by the third films. I, I was blinded by if I say what, it'll spoil the movie. So, yeah. So, but yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. Right. My only complaint is when, when they went back to. 1994 that um it seemed like other characters were aware of the realization that other characters had made that they wouldn't have known necessarily and that part was a little bit um clunky right but otherwise i like how they wrapped it up i liked the story overall yeah yeah Uh, i'll be surprised if they don't do a sequel Honestly, I think it went over pretty well with most viewers. I can't remember how many Fear Street books there are. Are there a lot? I do not know. I think so. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. I was a generation ahead of the generation that read those. Yeah, me me two, three, four, maybe four. Upcoming upcoming movies movies that I want to see, I'll just, uh, as, as we should do every sunday bitterly complain that antlers isn't out yet yep. yeah um, yes Sad. invasion the in- trailer for invasion 2021 looks interesting doesn't really show what's going on well, uh, that's good yeah yeah I- i'm really interested in seeing this and then the other movie i'm looking forward to which i think is going to be on netflix in five days on this coming Friday, July 23rd, is Blood Red Sky. I really want to see that. You guys haven't seen the trailer for this? Nope. Yeah, go to Netflix and, and or YouTube and type in Blood Red Sky trailer. Wait, I think that's the one that I posted, wasn't it? About the the basically vampires on a plane, but in the best way. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, yeah, I might have got it from you. I'm sure I probably did. Yeah. It looks know, awesome. It, it should have just been called Vampires on a Plane. I would be more interested than Snakes <laughs> on a Plane. Yeah, I would have been like, or as yeah, Matt Carpenter would say, much. "Big Ass Spider on a Plane." Yeah, yes. <laughs> he, really, he really wants to show us Big Ass Spider. Yeah, yeah like he just gotta. So I'm not gonna spoil Loki. The only thing I'm gonna say is. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness is coming up at some point, right? And Doctor right. Strange has got to be looking at... Yeah. Huh? Sam Raimi? Be looking, is this directing? Yes. Yeah, yeah. this is going to be a Lovecraftian movie. I, I, that's like the only Marvel thing I'm interested in. I saw Sam Raimi and they said it's going to be a horror movie and I said, okay. Might it's be Marvel. not yes. just going to be a horror movie. It's going to be a Lovecraftian movie or at least Cosmic Well, I didn't realize that. I knew there's oh, going to yeah. be like... They're like, it's going to be scary, people. I'm like, yeah. Damn. Well, supposedly one- the end of Loki season one was supposed to set up MCU four. Yeah. So oh. plus four. Wanda's going to be in it, and uh, but you got to be if you're Doctor Strange, you got to be looking at the end of Loki, going, what the 
fuck did you do? Now I got to fix it. You know, <laughs> this is why it's the multiverse of madness. Of course, it, well, technically it wasn't Loki, but well, if you haven't okay. seen it, I won't say All that. Right, so I, I wanna technically give, it wasn't. Technically it was. Yeah. I want to give everybody a week to watch it. And then I want to talk about it because there are your five day rule. I was going to say, is this Pete Rollick's rule? Yes. <laughs> I forgot what we were talking about. What happened to the three year rule? <laughs> yeah, you had some rule. It was very specific. <laughs> yes. You're like, that's Pete's rule. All right, five days down now? for next week. <laughs> I mean, we could talk uh, about it. But, I you mean, know, we can talk about it at the end. Well, and anybody I mean, that hasn't seen vague. it can log off. I, I, all right, so, here, so here's vagueness. If you, no, no, if, no, at the end of next week. But I want to do it now. Let me be vague now. Let me be vague uh, now. You can be vague now. Yeah. All right. So based on the we'll rules. be non-vague next week. Based on what we've learned from Loki, there was a multiverse. Right. And then they had a crisis on infinite Earths. And then there was. Like what? And then there, then there is again. That's fine. I get it. How You're an well? analyst, right? What? You're an analyst. Right? I'm an analyst. No, so, no, you don't get the reference. Never mind. I, I, I do I, get I, the reference. I get it too. In the Infinity War, what is Doctor Strange doing? Looking at all the possibilities. Looking at all the possibilities, yeah. But that's the multiverse. Or their possibilities. I'm just trying to figure out how it all works together and the rules. Yes. What makes an alternate universe real? Versus we could talk about that for hours. And remember, we have <laughs> what if coming up. And and that might be the whole thing that they define. It's like this is there are possibilities and then there are multiverses. Yeah. I don't buy the every time a human makes a choice to go left. In another reality, he creates a reality where he went right. Okay, does that apply to ants and squirrels too? So, but this goes back to my theory that, and if you look at some of the branches, I see in in Loki, you see some of the branches drifting back toward other branches. And I, I just I don't think, think humans are that important to well, create whole multiverses. I, I think one, it might be local, and mm. and two. Mm you might have an alternate timeline that pops out for 10, 20 years, but after that, it doesn't make any difference. So it just collapses back down to the nearest timeline. Or is it just a multiverse for you? Sure. But this, the, the idea but that multi, a, a multiverse might not be stable because the energy that it created is not sufficient to keep it separate. Right. And of course, creates the Mandala effect. There's a very close mirror to this to time travel. You've read The Man Who Folded Himself. Yes. Yes. So, which, which could be, it, it is in the top five time travel novels ever written. Right. Right Definitely. up there with all these zombies. So this might send yeah. me into another multiverse from this podcast, but when I always think of multiverses, it takes me back to the next gen episode where Worf is going through like 40 different enterprises and different universes. Yes. Yeah. Or going back even earlier to Dark Mirror in the original Star Trek. Right. Yes. What about what about sliders when Arturo remember that one episode where both Arturo seem exactly the same? And one makes it through the jump and the other one doesn't. And he goes, oh, my God. And it's never revealed if the original Arturo went with them or not. Right. Because they're pretty much identical. Yes. And um, I have to say, Bridget, I do think you are from an alternate reality today. <laughs> um, I mean, it, this is the first time I've seen the Catwoman headphones. Um, you know, maybe some choice was made in the last few days that branched a timeline. I don't know. I don't know. It's possible. Be careful the TVA may come after you. I think uh, it's yeah, just getting ready to move. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like we, we, next chapter. Exactly. 
He's asking. Catwoman. You are going to be pruned. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not pruned from the podcast. <laughs> no, not pruned from the podcast. Okay. Pruned from reality. Ooh. All you right. Know, well, if Loki, I end up, you know, if you've seen Loki, you know. What yes. That means. I'll, I'll figure out a way to send you some other um, message from the void. Okay. Thank you know you. I'm all right. <laughs> Thank you. Because we can't lose you on the podcast. So that's the important thing. So, and plus we want you to be okay that too. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> all right. I think we're done here unless anyone has any, anything else. No. Uh, next week, our friend and colleague, Anya Martin. So, um, she's, uh, she does quite a bit outer dark podcast, um, publisher writer. So, cool. uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, after that, James Chambers, the guy who edited, um, under twin sons, you know, the King and yellow anthology that has a previously unpublished Joe Pulver, Joe Pulver novella uh, which is probably worth the price alone um, and uh, uh, yeah 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 I got I got it right here I'm not uh, you had have to look it's from it's from hippocampus and um, it's called under twin sons alternate R histories of the yellow sign if you're into the king in yellow Joe Pulver, uh, the yellow sign, you know, any of that at all, you, really, you have to get this book. So James Chambers, that's the that's August 1st. And then Richard Chismar, August 8th. Uh, he just wrote a new book called Chasing the Boogeyman, which speaking of meta is very meta. So if you go to Amazon and, and type in Chasing the Boogeyman, you'll see what I mean. So... Uh, so yeah, the Chasing the Boogeyman comes out um, comes out on August 17th. So in about a month. So that, that'll be about right because that'll be that'll be like a two weeks before. So but it's really good. So so um, anyway, Anya Martin next week and guys. Thanks so much for being here and uh, everybody, those of you who are patrons, thank you for sincerely from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for keeping me going. And um, thank you for everybody who watches and listens and uh, thanks to the panelists. I really appreciate you guys. So see everybody next week. <laughs>